Let's see where this takes us. Hi, everybody. Data Percussion, Don Femulari here. This is fantastic. We thought we'd do something different today and just have a little bit of a more educational grouping here of sharing some ideas from my studio here that I'm in. I've got this incredible studio that I built, which is a 24 by 22 foot room in the back corner of my property. And I built this uh, 20 some odd years ago to have the privacy of having the facility set up at my home so I can walk, you know, a hundred you know, yards from my house and come out here. And uh, I'm in my little studio that's, uh, everything is wired for internet and electricity underground. So I've got this thing set up really, really well. It's made out of cement. So for lack of better terms, basically what I built was a bunker. So we're in this bunker of cement bunker. And kind of interesting, when I built the studio, the fun thing about it was that it's built out of cement cinder block. Now, cinder block, if you know cinder block, it's a cement, I think it's like about uh, 12 inches by six inches of what the block is, and it's hollow inside. So when they built the walls of the studio, <clears throat> I had them a company come by and blow in sound insulation, actually sound insulation blown into the actual walls of the studio. And by doing that, it just opened up a whole nother dimension of protecting now inside the cement, that sound insulation. Then I had four inches of airspace. Then I built the internal wall. So by having the studio built that way, everyone was concerned. I said, Dom, my gosh, that really is an overkill. Did you go there and do this at that level to have the workings of it? the fact that you didn't want any of your neighbors to hear you? I said, oh, no, not at all. I did this because I didn't want to hear my neighbors. When I'm in this studio, I want complete silence. I want to be able to be in here to teach, record, give master classes, and have these kinds of sessions with nobody outside annoying us with any kind of volume. So that's the insanity of how we are as drummers. I didn't want to hear them. So the joy of having a separate room that is built in the back corner of my property really is ideal for what we do. And the fact that I can come to you all from my facility to the globe. And I teach in here. I've got over 3,000 students that I teach in over 60 countries. It's, it's pretty overwhelming in how I schedule everybody in their time. And I use a program called Calendly that's on my website, domfamilara.com. And people can go by there and see my schedule and kind of plug in the holes that they want in what they have available for their own schedule. And then they go in there. It then sends them a Zoom link. And we're in action. So by having these programs work, it works out really well of the facility and the availability for an educational program to work. Now, I have been using this studio and this facility for well over 20 years. And I've been teaching online when Skype first came out almost 20 years ago. I started using Skype and uh, started teaching online because I saw the advantage of many students that I had met in my global travels, traveling for all the companies that I would travel for doing these clinics around the world. I would meet all these different company people and the companies are supporting me. I'm going to all these different countries and I'm meeting all these great drummers. Well, they wanted lessons. Some of them could fly out for lessons. Some of them could not. So by using Skype in the early stages, it really worked out well. And the challenge was at the time the internet was new, the, we had to use an external modem. So that was a bit of a challenge. So there were some obstacles that I had to figure out, but, I figured it all out. It worked out well. I've taught this way for many, many years. So when COVID hit, and I was getting calls from everyone, Dom, how do we have my studio set up? I want to start teaching online. How do we do it? And all I told them were two words, Jim Toscano. Jim Toscano is a student of mine who is just a phenomenal player. He lives in Staten Island. I live on Long Island. And Jim uh, would come out here for lessons. And during the lessons, he saw how my studio was set up. Well, the advantage that Jim has is not only is he a great player, a great session player, a great teacher with a great amount of students, but he's also a technologist. He understands technology to a very high level, microphone, sound, audio face, and of course, video interface. So he understands all of that. He's on top of all of the different companies that are supporting that. I have a Focusrite sound interface. I'm using Blackmagic for my video interface and all the stuff here I learned from Jim. 
So when you know, all these great drummers that were contacting me, well-known drummers that were contacting me to learn how to put their studio together, I just told them, Jim Toscano. They went to Jim, Jim helped them set up. And I told all of you that are out there, if any of you are into teaching or even just wanted to improve your studio, I would highly suggest you contact Jim Toscano and uh, you can go to jimtoscano.com, contact Jim, and he'll guide you along the way. And if you want to put certain cameras together and certain audio interface, he'll find out what your budget is, how much you want to spend, what you're trying to do, and what equipment you already have that you can kind of work into the program. And uh, Jim works out real well with that. And as he put this studio together now in this studio, and I don't have it set up right now, but I've got all different camera switches. And in a future session, when we do this here, I'll be able to show you all my different camera switches and what I'm doing. And you can see it all in the process. But uh, again, this is a part of the next step of what we want to do with Vader as far as educational ideas. And I want to share with you a couple of things. Now, I know a few of you that you join on. If you have any questions, by all means, Ask the question, Chad Brandolini, who is my producer of this event, he'll pop up your question. I'll see it on the screen and we'll uh, get it along and see where it's all at and help you out. But this is great to have this ability in my studio. I mean, I come out here sometimes at three o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, I come out here in my freaking pajamas. I come out here, I can hop on my drum set and play and have the ability of being able to just kind of just play and enjoy and creatively step into new ideas. I feel if an idea hits you or there's something that you wanna work on, as I'm working on several different drum books, as I'm working on this, if I'm up in the middle of the night, I'll come out to my studio and I'll hit it. I'm working on a current book with two wonderful young artists, Nina Parra, who's a phenomenal player from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Stefan Chamberlain, who's a wonderful young player from Quebec City, Canada. And they're two students of mine. And we're working on this next book, which is The Weaker Side. This was the original book that I put out with Stefan Chamberlain called The Weaker Side. And now what we're doing is we're taking The Weaker Side and we're putting accents into it. So it's accenting The Weaker Side. So there'll be a majority of the notes play with your left hand and you'll be understanding the accent and rebound code of movement that is happening, which is so beautiful that George Lawrence Stone did. And now we're putting it into the weaker side to open up that side of your playing. So I get to work with these wonderful students and we meet via this way, putting these books together and all these ideas come out and it's just so fantastic. And I think Nina has joined us here. Thanks so much, Nina, for joining us. And we've got so many great players that are here. So any questions you have, bring it on. But first, I want to explain my Vader Dom's pad sticks. This is so cool. These are the Vader Dom's pad sticks that Alan put together. And this easily is the best version of my pad stick I have ever had. And I'll tell you why for a few reasons. First of all, out of the mind of Alan Vader. Alan is an incredible, he really is you know, an incredible master at knowing wood and the context of wood and how to develop wood so it can last the longest amount of time for us. So when we're playing on the drums and whatever we're doing, we've got a stick in our hand that has a consistent feeling all the time. This really is pretty special at different levels. I've known Alan for many, many years. And we discussed about the pad stick and Alan's suggestion was to use a sugar maple. Sugar maple is a whole nother feel and consistency that Alan was able to put together. And on the sticks, I like a certain tacky finish. I hold the stick very loose in my hand. And I want to make sure I'm not getting any, any uh, text in here from Chad. So let me open up my phone here. Fantastic. So with this here, I like a certain tackiness because the technique that I teach is this free stroke, which is the technique that I learned from Joe Morello who learned from George Lawrence Stone, George Lawrence Stone being the author of Stick Control. Et voila. So what happened was this free stroke, this rebound movement in your hands, you want to hold the stick as loosely as possible. Well, if the stick has a little bit of a tackiness to it and a little bit of a finish to it, the stick stays better in your hand. So in the course of this process, in my discussions with Alan, and his great team over back at Vader, 
they discuss how to do this here by putting several more coats. I believe they're putting five coats of finish on this. And the tackiness is just subtle enough where it fits into your hands. And just the movement of how that stick feels in your hand. I am totally relaxed. I'm holding the stick very loosely and the stick is staying in my hand. So that's the two things, the sugar maple and the tackiness of that stick. The design was designed after the Bunkin 3S. Now, those of you that know the story, you will have heard me say this several times. Bunkin 3S was the stick that I had asked Joe Morello, what stick did you use when you were practicing as a young kid? And Joe said to me, the Bunkin 3S, B-O-N-K-E-N, the Bunkin 3S, 3S was the model of the stick, and Bunkin was the company. And I have a Bunkin 3S here. Check this out. You see that? Oh, boy. Bunkin 3S. Now, Bunkin was a stick company that was a husband and wife team, Bunny and Ken. Hence the name Bunkin. 3S was the stick size. And you can see it's got like a little, a ball of the stick on there. And it's made out of maple, a very, very light sugar maple. And this stick, Morello felt Stone wanted them to over exaggerate their movement. So by having a longer stick, but not a heavy stick, that was the key thing. That's part of what the maple is. Maple makes it lighter. And by it being a lighter stick, the stick is a larger stick, like a marching stick. So I have to over-exaggerate that motion of my wrist. That's where the development comes in. That's what Stone wanted. Hence, Morello used the Bunkin 3S. Well, it turned out, years later, when I talked to Jim Chapin, the top student under Sanford Moeller, when I said to Jim, what stick did Moeller like you to use? Jim said, the Bunkin 3S. Now, it, this to me was kind of mind-blowing in the process. Well, eventually in time, 1976, I go out to California so I can study with Shelly Mann. I studied with Morello, I studied with Chapin, and they felt I was ready to go out to Shelly Mann. Morello was the best student under George Lawrence Stone, so I wanted to learn that Stone free stroke wrist movement. Then after Morello, I went to Chapin to learn that molar arm whip motion. Once I started getting that down, then Chapin said, you're ready for Shelly Mann to understand the Gladstone, the Billy Gladstone finger movement. So kind of interesting to see in that motion. So the Gladstone finger movement actually came easier because I had the George Lawrence Stone method of free stroke and Chapin's molar in my hands, Gladstone became easier. So that was the order that they felt it was good to learn. Stone, Moeller, then Gladstone. Listen, people can achieve greatness by not following that routine. That's what I follow through by the guidance of these wonderful teachers. And that's pretty much how I teach. I get students to understand the free stroke in their wrist. Then we talk about Moeller in the whip. And then we get into Gladstone in their fingers. So that became the journey. Well, the Bunkin 3S, when I went to find a Bunkin 3S at that time, they didn't make them anymore. So I had gone to a store, actually up in the uh, in the, the Connecticut, Rhode Island area, and I found a store that had one Bunkin 3S stick. This is it here. Let's go back to the late 70s. I had the Bunkin 3S. I found this one stick. And then I went and I found a marching stick that was a maple stick. And I kind of sanded it down so it kind of looked like the Bunkin 3S. I kind of mapped it down and kind of sanded it. And then I put a, a spray varnish on it. I kind of sprayed it in my room and, and I made myself a pair of a very crude pair of Bunkin 3S. Well, in the course of time, it turns out that Alan Vader, his first facility was the old Bunkin factory. So it was so great to have the history just come full circle where Alan being schooled and understood about all these Bunkin sticks, was able to put together my pad stick in the history of what those Bunkins were. Well, in time, I was able to have a second Bunkin stick that came to me. 
And I've got a pair of bunkin sticks here. And these sticks probably go back probably about 80 years easily. So it's a pair of bunkin sticks that I still keep in my studio in the course of my teaching program here of what I have. So Alan Vader goes out with his team and they make my current Dom's pad stick. These are only sold on my website, domfamilara.com. You can go there on the online store. It's available. We ship them everywhere around the world. I've sold hundreds of them in this the last, the last couple of months. And it really is, for me, this the best feeling of a stick that I've ever had. And they come like this here. You'll see when you take them out, you'll see the gloss on them and the tackiness on them in how they are. And just out of the brilliance of Alan Vader, he was able to pull this off. So now that we've got the stick that I have, I went and I brought my crude bunkin remake to a lesson with Morello. Morello sees them, plays with the sticks, and says, wow, these are great bunkin sticks. Where did you get them? I said, Joe, they're not really bunkin sticks. I said, I kind of made them on my own. <laughs> he said to me, make me a pair. So I made a pair. I went back home, got another Scottish pair, sanded them down, sprayed them up, brought them to Morello. He loved them. Two weeks later, I got a call from Jim Chapin. I spoke to Morello, where are my bunkin sticks? I said, Jim, they're not really bunkin sticks. Am I? I tell the story, Chapin says, make me a pair. And if you go back and look at any old pictures of Chapin, go do a Google search of Jim Chapin on a practice pad. You will see him in all of the pictures. He's playing with my Dom's pad sticks. He loved the sticks that brought him back to his youth and that's what Mola wanted him to play. Several weeks later after talking to Chapin, I get a call from Shelly Mann who at that time is living out in the West Coast. They used to call me Fam. Shelly Man says, Fam, I spoke to Chapin and Morello. Where are my Bunkin 3S? So I got a kick that these guys all wanted these Bunkin 3Ss. So I made a pair for Shelly Man and sent it out to Shelly Man. And Shelly Man was just such another wonderful, phenomenal person and, and, and really a professor at the knowledge that he had as far as his skill. And Shelly Man was probably one of the top students, best students of Billy Gladstone. So I was very, very fortunate because of where I live here on Long Island that I was able to take some lessons with Morello, who lived in New Jersey. It was about a five hour drive to get to Jersey to see where Joe's lessons were. I'd go by there, take lessons with Morello, came back. Jim Chapin lived here on Long Island. So I lucked up by having Jim very close to me here, going by and taking lessons with Jim. And then when they said I was ready for Shelly Mann, Shelly lived in California. I had put a band together with some dear friends, Frank Goldstein and Antonio Pesado. We put a band together, keyboard, bass, you know, and drums. We drove to California, went out there to put the band together to play out there, and I was able to take lessons with Shelly Mann, just a beautiful guy. And while out there, I also studied with Johnny Gurin, another phenomenal drummer, Jim Keltner, Joe Procaro, all these great players were out there, Colin Bailey, and I was able to, at 1976, that's where I had met Jeff Porcaro. And that's a whole other story. Jeff became a, a dear friend and was just an incredible, beautiful player and person. We have some great, great memories. So it all kind of came down to these, these bunkin sticks that I was able to practice with and learn these techniques. So the sticks to me were a very important part of the development because, again, what these teachers said, they want your hands to stretch and strengthen. Now think about that as far as muscle development. And I'll talk to Chad, who I know Chad is listening on this here. Chad, if there are any questions that come up, by all means, just throw them up on the screen and I'll, I'll take them at any time. Let's start with here, Frank Perry. Could you talk about the benefits of online teaching? Oh man, Frank Perry is a phenomenal teacher and a student of mine that has came back to me for, my gosh, Frank, we go back about 30 plus years. And Frank is a phenomenal teacher here in the Long Island area. And uh, Frank now is setting up his studio for online teaching. And Frank has set up his studio by connecting with Jim Toscano. Jim Toscano's the guy, man. He's going to help you out. And Frank understands all these techniques as he studied with me. And the online teaching journey, to me, is where the future is at. There are many, many advantages to here. And I know many students say, no, Dom, I don't like doing online. I like coming in person. Well, the advantages of doing it online are number one, you're not making the drive to come out here. You know, to where I live at my studio, if I'm on Long Island, I'm about 45 minutes to an hour out of New York City. 
So if you want to drive out here, it's a drive in your car or it's an hour plus ride on the train. I pick you up at the train station. I've got students that come down from Boston. Sometimes they come down and they take the ferry into Port Jefferson where I live. I go by and I pick them up and they come by here. And that's all great when someone's in person and I love that. The advantages of the online teaching is the fact that now you've cut out all that traveling. So if, you, if it took you an hour to get here for an hour lesson and then an hour back, you spent two hours traveling for a one hour lesson. My suggestion is online, let's do a two hour lesson so we can even move further. And now you have an extra hour that you save for practicing. You've got more practice time. So the advantage, first advantage is the fact that we've cut out the traveling. We can have this level of interaction where we can speak and it is really in live real time. The second advantage that we have is the fact that I can absolutely see you in the confines of your own home, in your area where your drums are, on your drum set. So when you come here, I've got a second kit that I have over here for the student setup. They come on by here and you have to adjust it and you play it and you might not be as comfortable. When you're at home on your own drum set, you are in the ultimate comfort zone. And I'm able to see you on your kit and we're able to discuss the ergonomics of how the kit is set up. How are you sitting? How's your posture? Are the drums set up to a place where you're not reaching for them? Are the cymbals too high? Can you bring them down? When we start to work on all this stuff here, where's your right cymbal? How's that feel? Do you want to put a left hand right up? When we start discussing all this, it opens up a whole nother area of us fine tuning your drum set to make this best for you. So I would highly suggest you having the opportunity of being able to pull this off, do an online lesson and take the advantage. And with some of the students, we'll do three or four online lessons if they live in the area. And then they'll come into a lesson here in the studio and I'll see them in person and we'll work on certain things. And now of course with COVID, if everyone's got the vaccine as I do and we're socially distanced, we can set up six to eight feet apart so we can have the online lessons, we're in action and we're making it happen. So those are some of the advantages of online lessons. Frank, thanks so much for that question. Let's see what else we have. From uh, Mr. Lindsay McDonald, I am curious about the Gladstone finger technique. Can you give us a little demo on it? Mr. Lindsay McDonald, absolutely. Listen, I'm like a drumming jukebox. Think about this here. You guys ask a question and immediately at the snap of your finger, I'm talking about Gladstone and finger technique. So Shelly Mann, was a young, young drummer that lived in New York. And Shelly Mann's father was a percussionist who played mallets in many of the symphonies and television shows that were happening in New York at that time, many, many years ago. And he played mallets, and on the snare drum in the symphony was Billy Gladstone. So Shelly Mann's father was very, very good friends with Gladstone. When Shelly Mann, as a young child, wanted to learn drumming, his father said, there's only one guy you're going to, and that's going to be Gladstone. Well, it turned out that he studied with Billy Gladstone for many years, and then Shelly Mann actually went to Boston and studied with George Lawrence Stone, and here on Long Island also studied with Moeller. So a lot of these guys connected with these players because Shelly Mann got the finger technique from Billy Gladstone, then went to Stone and got the Stone wrist technique, and then went to Moeller and got Mola's technique. So Gladstone is here. Think of your hand in French grip position. French grip position is in here, sticks a parallel. And in that position, I'll take my left hand first. In that position, I am only using my fingers. Notice there's no wrist motion. motion. So in the wrist movement, if I play the wrist movement, that's wrist. If I go to fingers, it's only these three fingers that are moving. Now, a great exercise to practice is this. Hold the stick three quarters up, shoulders relaxed. I'll go to the side here, and I'm going to play those three fingers under my arm. So it's only these three fingers that are working. No wrist motion. 
You can practice this anywhere. You can play singles. You can play both of them together, flat flams as we call them. You can play doubles. You can play triples. Paradiddles. Move that along in your fingers. Have that accessibility. It's fantastic. So Gladstone, just in brief, again, we can talk many, many hours on Gladstone alone, and there are many exercises, but Gladstone was about just understanding finger movement. And Jojo Meyer's Secret Weapons of a Modern Drummer talks about that. I actually worked with Jojo on that DVD to get the action and understanding of Gladstone, Stone, and Moeller. And Jojo makes mention of myself and my book on that. I was very, very thankful for the honorable mention. I've been talking about it. And It's Your Move book, as I said, was a book that discusses free stroke and molar. I didn't get the Gladstone in there. It's Your Move book two is going to have more Gladstone. So Mr. Lindsay McDonald, go on there, focus on just fingers. And remember, you want to hold your wrist still. There's no wrist motion. It's only fingers. So with that motion, that's a little taste of what Gladstone was about. Thanks so much. Any other questions? Bring them on. This is Samuel Hour, the Human Drum Jukebox. If there's no questions popping up, I'm going to continue on. So in this process of having these sticks to where they are, this really kind of allows our hands to over-exaggerate. So if I talk about George Lawrence Stone, this motion of this free stroke, I throw the stick down and the stick jumps back into my hand. This is a very, very important part of the study of this here. I throw it down and I only think down. If you notice, I'm not winding up. It's not this. I'm not going back to go down. And there are tons of material you can get on the free stroke. My book, It's Your Move, is available through Alfred Publishing if you want the print copy. Or I'd even suggest the digital download, which is happening on HudsonMusic.com. HudsonMusic.com has so many great digital books that are in print that, are, that might not be available in digital. Hudson's got them. It's fantastic. The advantage of digital now in the future, you can carry it on your laptop or on your phone or on your tablet. And the other advantage is you can have it delivered to you in about 11 seconds. You pay for it, you click it, bang, you've got it on your phone. Thank you so much. It's real simple. So the process of this free stroke to throw down and let that stick bounce back up, that's kind of what this began. I throw it down, the stick bounces back up. I throw it down, I follow it back up. So I'm not pulling it up. And that's what this free stroke and that this George Lawrence Stone concept is about. There's no up. It's only down. I throw down, the stick bounces up. Now I'm playing it in a full stroke position. If I go to a half stroke position here, same thing. I throw it down, it bounces back up. I'm not pulling this up. I'm throwing it down and I'm letting it bounce back up. Same thing if I'm playing in a low stroke position. I throw it down and the stick bounces back up. There's many, many different sheets that you can download for understanding. On my website, domfamilara.com, there's a menu that says free downloads. Free downloads. Come on! Is anything in this world free? Oh my gosh. Free downloads. Go on that site. Click on the PDFs and download it to your computer so you have the information that I have on there. And I'm adding more stuff in there in the free download section. Let's see what we have here. From Larry Rizzo. Don, would you ever use the three fingers separately or are they always working together? Going back to the Gladstone stuff. Larry, great question. Thank you so much. There are some exercises that I saw from a lot of drummers when I went to Israel. There were many drummers there that used to use one finger each time when they played. Where each finger I'm using separately. 
And it was an interesting exercise to develop control in each finger. And what they would do is they would use those fingers the way a trumpet player would play, how they would play the three valves. Well, they would use that with each three fingers and going by. So I would practice that. And just to kind of get a feel for it, I never really use it in my playing, but I would practice it just to get a feel for it. So Larry, the answer to your question is try it out. If it works for you and it's comfortable, you may find a way of how you can adapt that into your playing. You may not, but at least understanding the movement of it is fantastic. I pretty much use all of my finger technique with all of them together. So these three fingers are working together in the journey of what it is. You can see on my hand here. It's all together. Now, a great exercise, which I know many of you know, which I got from Shelly Mann. If you want to understand that finger technique, and Larry, I'm sure you've probably seen this with me too. If anybody who's watching this who has not seen this, put your sticks down and hold your hands up like this in here. Relax your shoulders. Touch your thumb and your index finger together and stretch these three fingers all the way up. Between your thumb and your index finger, zero tension. Do not squeeze. There is no squeezing. The line is tension is the enemy of movement. Let me show you this t-shirt. Hang on a second. I got a couple t-shirts that I made. And all the proceeds on these t-shirts go to a scholarship program that I have. Tension is the enemy of movement. That's the line I want you to remember. These t-shirts, all the proceeds go back to a scholarship program that I have. So when I meet young students that cannot afford lessons, I either pay their lessons for another teacher or I teach them free just to get them in, to get them going. Tension is the enemy of movement. That's a part of what we're doing there with these t-shirts. I have also got this. Check this out. Beat the virus. Come on, let's get out there and support this in having these t-shirts to support future drummers in their education. So in this now, go back to that position. In that position, you've got your thumb and your index finger just slightly touching each other and these three fingers. And now do this. I'm going to put the metronome on 140. Okay, here we go here. One and two and three and four and bring those fingers all the way down. All the way down. Do not curl them. Bring them all the way down at that tempo. One and two and three and four and. Just try this. And again, there's no squeezing. There's no squeezing in your thumb and index finger. Keep doing that nonstop. Feel this. This is the greatest feeling in the word. Worldwide technique, this is it. Shelly Man gave this to me in one of my first lessons. And by doing this, it stretches the muscles in your forearm and really feels you to understand what those three fingers will do. Well, it turned out that these, these fingers really worked out really well because not only does it help you with Gladstone finger technique, but it also helps in the free stroke by allowing that stick to rebound. So that motion, as you're doing this here, I say do it three to five minutes a day. Start doing it at 140. If after three to five minutes, 140, you did not feel any, you know, stretching or development, put it on 150. Do it again for three to five minutes. If you got to 140 and after one minute you were dying, bring it down to 130. So find the tempo that best suits you in the course of that exercise. But this exercise now, I can do pretty quickly for a long period of time from having done it for many, many years. And in that motion, that motion is exactly the motion that's going to help you. So when you get into this Gladstone finger movement, it's those fingers that are in there that are working for you. So again, that finger technique with Gladstone opens up all three fingers together. And I'd say... If you can, try them separately, see how that feels. But that's a part of what one of those exercises are. If we have any more questions, pop them in. I'm just going to keep on talking.
while I have this opportunity in this short amount of time, I'm going to throw as much as I can on you. And again, I've got tons of students that come by and learn this. And to me, these are some techniques that are really foundational movements. You know, drumming is about movement. And I say to you all to understand the process. This here, first of all, relaxed movement creates relaxed sound. Fluid movement creates fluid sound. Consistent movement creates consistent sound. We want relaxed, fluid, consistent sound, so we must understand to develop the movement to deliver us to that sound. Tense movement creates tense sound. And what did I say? Et voila. Tension is the enemy of movement. We want to be able to feel that relaxation. Tension locks the muscle down and prevents us from understanding that. Now, all of these different movements, you can practice to all the rudiments. And what you can do is go to Vader.com and pull up the rudiment sheet that you can download free. On Vader.com, go down there, download a free rudiment chart, PDF, Vader.com. Go there and do it. And it really is very, very helpful to understand applying all these movements. You can practice those rudiments with stone just from the wrist. So if I'm practicing paradiddles in half strokes, I'm practicing them here. If I want to put an accent on that with molar or again fingers. So you can apply those rudiments with those three different movements. Download from Vader PDFs of the rudiment sheet. These are the PAS 40 rudiments that Percussive Art Society added. And understand the idea about the rudiments, that in the early stages, there were 13 fundamental rudiments that kind of came out as far as sticking patterns that were commonly used in a lot of the marching and drum corps playing. Then eventually, in 1933, George Lawrence Stone and William Ludwig got together with J. Burns Moore and Ed B. Strait and put together Nard's 26 rudiments. Now, check this out. Did you believe how informative this day was going to be? Holy mackerel. I'm taking a day out of my teaching practice, and we're cranking this up. Check out this picture. You see that? That is the original NARD, the National Association of Rudimental Drummers. And that's George Lawrence Stone and William Ludwig, all these great guys. It's in the old NARD book. If you get the NARD rudimental book, which you can still track down, that picture is in there. It really is kind of interesting to see. They then put together 26 rudiments. They felt that there were more sticking patterns that were becoming very common because now we were stepping in to modern drum set. And modern drum set was opening up a whole nother different sense of rudimental and rhythmical patterns. So they had 26 rudiments. Well, in 1985, the Because of Art Society got together with a team of people, and I was involved in some of that. And what they did was they added other rhythms that now brought contemporary drumming up to 40 rudiments. So what you'll download on vader.com on the rudimental sheet in the PDF will be the 40 PS rudiments. Go down there and check it out. It's extremely helpful. And there was a chart that was put together that, uh, that I have here that is so great. That was a chart that was put together of all the Vader rudiments on here. They're going to get these charts pretty much soon back in action. And this is the chart that I have in my studio here. And this was put together by the great late Dick DeCenzo, who was a phenomenal drummer and teacher, owned a drum shop, up in the Boston area, a great, great guy. I was able to know Dick. And his son, Dave DeCenzo, is just a phenomenal player also. And this was also put together by Fred Dinkins. Fred Dinkins is a phenomenal player who's got a book out called It's About Time on Alfred Publications. And Fred is a phenomenal player and a teacher who teaches out at Musicians Institute. So if you get a chance to go out, check out Freddie Dinkins out there too. And uh, in honor and the testimonial to Dick DeCenzo, who was just a beautiful person and a beautiful drummer that helped us out tremendously for many, many years. So that's part of the poster. Let's go back to the six now. So we go back to understand these three motions. 
So again, George Lawrence Stone, that freeze joke. And one of the exercises you can do, which may not be as easy as you think, hold the stick in your hand, pick up the stick, and dribble the stick. This is rebound. This is what George Lawrence Stone was talking about. Understand the rebound of that stick, to play that stick, let the stick bounce, then reverse it with your other hand, and go and get the same feeling. Oh, man, that's a phenomenal understanding of rebound, like dribbling a basketball and bouncing the ball, which Stone talks about in his book, Accents and Rebounds. So all of you should have accents and rebounds. All of you should have stick control. Those are fundamental reading books that we have for developing technique and exercises. And with George Lawrence Stone, that motion of throwing it down and letting it bounce, again, happened in a full stroke position, happens in a half stroke position. And if you notice, I'm not going any further up, up to that half stroke. I'm right here. I'm staying down at that half stroke. I'm not going any further up. I just throw down and I catch it back at a half stroke height. So that's the free stroke, half stroke. And then I go down to the free stroke, low stroke, which is down in here too. I just throw down and let the stick just rebound in that free stroke rebound sensation. Real fun stuff. And when I went back to thinking about taking lessons with Morello back in those early days, there were some great, great drummers that were there. John Riley was there, the great jazz drummer, and Danny Gottlieb, also a great, great jazz drummer and great fusion drummer. These guys were students at that time, and I was just honored to be in their company. These are great, great people, great players, and they're very, very knowledgeable. And I still look up to them as far as their advice and their counsel in drumming. Brilliant, brilliant guys. And there was one other guy there, too, Steve Foster. Steve Foster was a, another student of Morello at that time. He lived near Morello in New Jersey, and he was probably there longer than any of us. And Steve Foster is still around, living in New Jersey, playing better than ever. And it was those gentlemen that I was able to kind of confide in and get their expertise. When we, we, we did Accents and Rebounds, I went to these great drummers and tracked them down and was able to get John Riley, myself, Danny Gottlieb, and Steve Foster into the workings of this speaking and the understanding of the book Accents and Rebounds in the new revised edition. So this is fantastic. Let's see, do we have any other questions that might be there before I wind down? Let's see what we have. I, I can't see all the different names that are on here, but I see people have joined us and have gone by. We have uh, Andy Sebastia. Your thoughts on the book Finger by Burns and Mallon. Wow, boy, very, very good. Uh, great, great book. That's a great book about finger movement that is extremely helpful. It's got some great exercises. And uh, boy, thanks so much for even bringing that up. There are some great exercises in that. And there are some phenomenal understanding of just taking in different patterns that you have. And that book would be very, very helpful. And you could also use stick control and apply it for finger technique. There are many, many exercises. Maybe someday in the future, we can do a class here on just specifically on maybe stone, on molar, and of course on Gladstone to continue the process of what's going along in all this different learning. Boy, great, great stuff, everybody. This has been great to have some time. Let's see. Pedro Barahona, phenomenal drummer from Chile, who I'm going to probably see at some point. He's coming into New York. I always see you with two pads. Any particular reason? Excellent question, Pedro Barahona from Chile. And he's coming out to come to New York to visit, and he's bringing me some Chilean wine. Absolutely. We're going to meet here in the studio, and it's been great, great to see him. Pedro was a phenomenal teacher who also helped me out on one of my sheets that you'll see on my free download on my website, where I add the different fulcrums. That's Pedro Barahona who helped me out to put together that graphic, so you'll see that also. The two pads. First of all, I swear by the Vader pad. The Vader pad is one of the only pads that comes out that is actual gum rubber. It's gum rubber because it's the original rubber that is used by all these great players. When I went to Morello and Chapin and Shelly Mann, they always swore by gum rubber. Many of the new pad companies that have come out are not using gum rubber. 
They're using a synthetic type of rubber-like product. And I like the original rubber product, which is there. So again, the Vader pads are the actual rubber product. Now, the reason why I use two pads, Pedro, which is a great question, is I want to put them on a snare stand. And when I put one pad on, the claws of the actual snare stand stick up. And when I'm playing, many times I hit the actual claw. And that drives me insane. So by putting an extra pad on here, I put the extra pad on there, and now the claws are lower than the pad. So I have accessibility of being able to A whisper to a yell, you can have fun in doing it. And the key thing about the two pads is that it allows me to, to step away from the actual motion of those claws. Great, great question. <laughs> We're squeezing a lot in in a short amount of time. So I want to thank you all for coming by here. Any other questions that we have, I can squeeze one more in. But the fact is that Vader allows us to put this together and have this time through StreamYard. We get to go through. Facebook, and we get to go to the YouTube channel. So you can go to Vader.com, check out any information, but also go to the Vader YouTube channel. All of these different exercises are up there, and all these different interviews that I do every Tuesday at 2 o'clock. It's so great to have the opportunity of being able to meet so many great, great artists and have this kind of opportunity to share some ideas and talk to you all and meet some familiar people that I have on here and meet some new friends. Go to domfamilara.com. My email address is there. Everything is there. You can contact me, ask me any questions. To have all of you join me at this time, I'm very thankful and very grateful. And you all have been fantastic. Stay safe. And hopefully at some point, I'll get to see you all around the world when I get to travel back again. And any questions you have, email me. We'll touch base. Thank you so much. Chad Bradley, thank you so much for organizing this and making this happen. Guys, thanks so much. Good talking to you. Nice knowing you. Thanks. <laughs>